so uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mayur for uh, making me a part of this conference and congratulations to all your team for uh, organizing this conference. So uh, the topic I am uh, talking about today is recent advances in the management of hypoparathyroidism. So uh, first, I will be uh, talking about gloss overview uh, and few slides about the clinical features and management, and compare, followed by comparison of conventional therapies, their limitations, and recent advances, as well as some molecules in the pipeline of management of hypoparathyroidism. So to start with, so what is hypoparathyroidism? So it is a disease characterized by the absence or inappropriately low concentration of circulating PTH hormones, which leads to the hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, and elevated fractional excretion of calcium in the urine. So the role of PTH is in promotion of the renal reabsorption of calcium, stimulating renal phosphate excretion, and promote conversion of 25 OSD to uh, active form of vitamin D, and it is a powerful regulator of the bone turnovers. So how PTH uh, uh, controls the mineral metabolism? See, uh, this is a uh, low serum calcium level. It is sensed to the CSR receptors on the uh, parathyroid cells. And uh, CSR receptors, is, their stimulation uh, increases the PTH in the circulation. Now, this PTH goes, uh, goes and acts at the three levels. It goes to the bones, uh, causing the uh, bone desorption and thereby increasing the serum calcium levels. Secondly, it goes to the kidneys, thereby has an important role in conversion of 25 OSD to active form of vitamin D calcifier, uh, 125 OSD, which promotes intestinal absorption of calcium and thereby increasing the serum calcium levels. And thirdly, it increases calcium reabsorption from the kidneys. So all, over, all the effects of the PTH are to increase the serum calcium and decrease phosphate in the, uh, into the serum. And this, all this metabolism is tightly regulated. So when the actions of PTH are reduced or lost, all subsequent steps of ma uh, maintaining the homeostasis are impaired and resulting in hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, and hypercalciuria. Now, this is a gross overview of regulation of PTA synthesis, secretion and action, and associate, associated genetic disorders. So they are broadly categorized and uh, at the uh, cellular level, at the uh, cell membrane level of PTH, whether PTH or target cells, it is autosomal dominant hypocalcemia as well as autosomal dominant hypo hypocalcemia and partisan. And uh, syndromic hypoparia, where transcription factor defects are present, and they are categorized as uh, transcription factor defects like Kinn's hair, Mila's, MTP deficiency, Kenny Caffey, Sanjay Sakari, Dijoj, Charge, part of APS type 1, SDR, Kenny Caffey. Isolated hypoparia occurs uh, when the defect is at the PTS synthesis level or at the PTS secretions level. So, uh, the most common cause of hypoparia is surgical, post-surgical hypopara. It is followed by the idiopathic as well as autoimmune. The genetic basis of hypopara forms a very less, but very important topics. So they are broadly categorized into five, five categories. There is the isolated, uh, forming the autosomal dominant, recessive or X-linked, congenital multisystem disorders like digestion water, metabolic disorders, autoimmune disorders as a part of EPS1, and parathyroid resistance syndrome pseudo hypopara. Uh, these are uh, uh, simple pictures showing the clinical manifestations of hypopara. So most of the clinical manifestations of hypopara, they are associated with the peripheral nervous systems. So paresthesia, muscle cramps, and titini. They are very much common and most common uh, clinical features. Whereas less, uh, less commonly encountered, but more important, they are calcifications, uh, especially in the basal ganglia, cerebellar uh, calcifications, cardiovascular uh, clinical features like cardiac arrhythmias and cardiomyopathies. Respiratory system causing laryngospasm, the renal system associated with nephrocalcinosis and lithiasis, uh, thereby increasing the chances of chronic kidney disease when the patient is on therapy. Neuropsychiatric symptoms like anxiety and depression, cataract, very, uh, very common uh, clinical feature of hypopara, altered tooth morphology, skin manifestations in the form of dry skin and onycholysis, muscular system in the form of myopathy and spondylarthritis. So these are uh, very common clinical manifestations, but the most commonly encountered are muscle cramps, titani paresthesia, basal ganglia calcifications, as well as nephrolithiasis and calcinosis when patient is on treatment. Now, this is a picture of showing extra skeletal calcifications. So this is a coronal picture and sagittal picture, CT head of the uh, individual in hypopara. This is showing extensive symmetrical calcifications involving, involving the subcortical white matter, basal ganglia, as well as the cerebellar areas. And this is the abdominal CT of an individual 
with long standing idiopathic hypoparia and which is on treatment showing the bilateral large stones and the largest one is the staghorn calculus uh, now uh, the discussion of today is management of hypoparathyroidism so the conventional therapy is what we have been using and still commonly used is oral calcium calcium in the form of calcium carbonate or citrate and the active form of vitamin D in the form of calcitriol and thyroid diabetes when the patient is not adequately controlled maintaining you calcemia after these oral calcium and active vitamin D or there is increased incidence of uh, nephrolithiasis of calcinosis so thyroid diabetes may be added and they increase the reabsorption of the calcium at the distal tubules and magnesium supplementation in those therapy cases but the majority of treatment is with oral calcium and active vitamin D so the this is the tabular form of the doses forms so the typical doses of calcium carbonate and citrate are 1 to 9 grams and 1 to 9 grams in 2 to 4 divided doses of calcium vitamin d preparation they are used as ergo calciferol or polycalciferol to maintain the uh, serum vitamin d level of more than 30 nanogram per ml now various studies have suggested that if we are using vitamin d as a treatment of hypopara then very large amount of vitamin d may be required approximately 40000 to 1.2 lakh unit per day to maintain the you can see me so calcitriol forms the uh, molecule of choice vitamin d molecule of choice in management of hypopara and it can be given up to the dose of 2 microgram but usually uh, 1 to 1.5 microgram are more than sufficient alpha calcidol it can be given up to 4 microgram per day thyroid diuretics when the patient has high risk of nephrolithiasis and calcinosis so hydrochlorothiazide chlorothaladone indapamide and amylodide they may also be used now there are a few limitations of these conventional therapies the first it does not replace the other functions of pts they can maintain the you calcemia as well as uh, you uh, phosphatemia but they do not uh, have the effect of decrease the uh, renal excretion of calcium and they have unpredictable occurrence of hypo as well as hypercalcemia there is increased calcium phosphate products of more than 55 thereby increasing the uh, ectopic calcifications like nephrocalcinosis nephrolithiasis and renal uh, dysfunction possibilities are more so the emerging treatments teriparatide first to discuss is teriparatide so pth 134 it has been evaluated in a number of studies in adults as well as pediatric patients with post surgical hypopara and permanent hypopara from other causes and it appears to be safe and efficacious urine calcium in pth 134 treated patients they were decreased when injections were given once a day compared to calcitriol treated controls second in a study of 14 children treated with twice daily pth for 28 weeks once daily injection serum calcium magnesium and urine calcium parameters they were better controlled in twice daily injection compared to once daily treatment especially in the second half of the day and when pth 134 was given by an insulin pump as com- as compared to the continuous infusion urine calcium reduction by 50% and serum calcium was near normal with minimal fluctuations of uh, compared to twice daily injections and there is improvement in mental as well as physical health has been reported so have uh, we have three types of studies first study once daily pth injection versus calcitriol oral second study is comparing once daily pth injection versus twice daily pth injections and third study comparing twice daily uh, uh, pth injection versus infusion uh, infusion pumps so let's discuss one by one So this is the first case report of a once daily PTA subcutaneous injection given over four days in a 14 year old boy with post surgical hypopara. So these uh, blue dots are for serum calcium and these red dots are for serum phosphate. Now you see uh, that serum calcium level they are gradually increasing and phosphorus levels they are gradually it is gradually decreasing. Similarly for uh, calcium and phosphorus in the urine, so calcium in the urine it is gradually decreased and phosphorus in the urine is gradually increased. now uh, this uh, second uh, uh, second study uh, the serial urine calcium levels in response to pth 134 uh, versus calcitriol and calcium in the adults with hypopara the repeated measures of urine calcium excretion after subcutaneous 134 injection given at time 0 uh, biphasic biphasic response and overall decrease in the calcium excretion calcitriol and calcium retaining effects on the kidney and led to a serum rise in serum uh, urine calcium excretion so urine calcium levels this is the pth and this is the calcitriol so you can see the uh, urine calcium level it is gradually decreased and 
this calcium calcium fibers using calcium uh, now this again graph this showing the serial every two hourly serum calcium levels comparing pth 134 delivered by the twice daily subcutaneous injection versus insulin pump in children with hypopara so this uh, dotted lines these are for injections and this continuous line is for the pump now you can see uh, when uh, injections were given twice daily the serum calcium level is toward the low normal level but uh, there is wide fluctuations but when it when it is given with the pump therapies then serum calcium level is towards the normal day but there is less fluctuations similarly the serum urine calcium excretions levels compared with pts 34 by twice daily injection versus pump so this is urine calcium levels and you can see that when patient is given injection with a subcutaneous injection there is wide variations of the urine calcium level where there is sustained urinary calcium uh, reabsorption in uh, pump therapies uh, now another graph the difference between once daily pth and uh, versus twice daily pth so uh, for serum magnesium levels these are serum magnesium levels and their magnesium levels is improved uh, during the latter half of the day with twice daily pth injection so uh, this is once daily pth these red dots and these white dots are twice daily pth so you can see see the magnesium levels they are uh, gradually increased to upper normal uh, low normal limit but as compared to the once daily pth so twice daily pth injection has a favorable effect on serum magnesium levels now uh, this again this graph uh, this is serum magnesium levels in pump therapies versus twice daily this is subcutaneous once daily versus twice daily and this is uh, subcutaneous twice daily versus pump therapy. So you can see subcutaneous twice daily, although it has a favorable outcome, but the pump therapies has a very sustained effect and there is very less, almost negligible fluctuations of serum magnesium levels. So pump therapies is uh, considered is uh, superior to twice daily injections. So continuous PTH administrations, uh, it mimics the endogenous PTH secretion. It normalizes serum calcium level, phosphorus levels, Urinary calcium levels are uh, urinary calcium excretions decrease, bone remodeling, and magnesium levels are improved significantly. So continuous exposure of PTH it provides a highly physiological effect to reverse the biochemical derangements that are hallmark of hypopara. The recombinant human PTH it is first approved uh, form of PTH and it was approved by FDA in January 2015. So it is indicated for adjunctive treatment in management of hypopara in individuals not adequately controlled with calcium, active vitamin D, thiazide dietics, or maximum therapies. And the uh, RHPTH, uh, in an open level trial of 27 patients treated with RHPTH 184 every other day, at the 100 microgram dose for four years, it showed that all patients have stable serum calcium and were able to reduce their calcium and active vitamin D supplementation significantly. Now this uh, landmark replace trial uh, it is done with RHPTH 184 and showed that 50%, 53% of treated subjects, they were able to reduce their supplemental calcium and active vitamin dose by 50%. And nearly 43%, they were able, able to completely stop all active vitamin D and calcium supplementation uh, uh, by PTH injections alone or calcium dose uh, reduced to less than 500 and maintaining all uh, serum calcium at uh, phosphorus levels. And the uh, various side effects like uh, muscle spasm, hypocalcemia, paresthesia, headaches, and nausea, they were observed, most, uh, most commonly observed, and they are uh, those receiving PTH compared to placebo. But these occurred during the dose titration or at the beginning of the study. So what are the indications of use of uh, PTH 184? So expert opinion uh, on the first international conference on management of hypopara to guide the use of full-length recombinant human PTH. It was published in JCM in 2016. So uh, RHPTH therapy is indicated in those patients who have inadequate control of serum calcium, hypocalcemia, or erratic swings to hypocalcemia or hypercalcemia on conventional therapies. Second indication is dose of supplemental calcium more than 2.5 or active vitamin D doses more than 1.5 or uh, more than 3 microgram of alpha calcium. Third indication is when there is renal involvement, involvement with hypercalcemia, nephrocalcinosis, lithiasis, or reduced tenic, tenic clearance or progression to the CKD or conventional therapies. And uh, another indication is hyperphosphatemia or a calcium phosphate product more than 55 leading to nephrolithiasis and calcinosis on conventional therapies. Uh, patients suffering from GI disorders or post-baric surgery, those are associated with the malabsorption of calcium. 
So they have also an uh, indication. And when there is reduced quality of life from conventional therapy. So these are few uh, indications for consideration of RHPTS uh, therapies. Uh, now, uh, the few, uh, few uh, future therapies, RHPTH-184, it is already approved. PTH-134, it is individualizing dosing. Administered should be administered twice daily or even thrice daily injections. Another molecule in uh, pipeline is transform PTH. It is inactive product of PTH designed to achieve an infusion-like profile by liberating sustained PTH in a sustained fashion. Another molecule, PCO-371, it is less potent than uh, PTH and effects were more long-lasting than those of PTH-134 or 184. And this molecule, uh, long-acting PTH, this is prolonged and enhanced effect on blood, uh, blood calcium levels in hypoparathyroid. So what are the gaps in management of hypoparathyroid right now? There is a lack of technology to continuously monitor endogenous calcium levels because calcium level fluctuations they vary widely uh, with exercise or general illness. So a device for monitoring of calcium to allow for the dose adjustment in response to fluctuations in blood calcium would facilitate such titration. So such a calcium uh, continuous calcium sensor in combination with PTH delivery by pump device it could constitute a transformative closed loop artificial pathoid system for hypothyroid patient, uh, just like similar for uh, uh, CGMS as well as CGMS plus uh, insulin delivery systems for diabetes. So continuous monitoring uh, device for calcium and uh, PTS therapy should be short off. So to conclude my talk, the prevention of long-term complication of hypopathy is still unknown and PTS therapy is likely to be most effective when administered in physiological manner that minimizes serum and urinary calcium fractures, particularly most useful in decreasing the, decreasing the urinary calcium. And yet, large and long-term studies testing the continuous pH exposure are lacking. Thank you.